Welcome back. In the last lecture, we looked at symmetries and quantum mechanics. And I made an argument that symmetries should be labeled by groups. So if you have a quantum mechanical system that exhibits, furnishes, or has a symmetry, then the way you would quantify that or give a name to those symmetry operations is with elements of a group G. And the notion of these symmetries taking place or being done or uh, somehow being represented, and that's the key word here, on the quantum mechanical system is via so-called symmetry transformations. So the way, if you have a group of symmetries, the symmetries themselves are just a bunch of names for things, names of operations. But that doesn't mean you've done the operation on a quantum mechanical system. What does it mean to do it or implement it or furnish it or uh, represent it, it means you have to do a thing called a symmetry transformation. There has to be a notion of what it even means in quantum mechanics. And this is something, this is an operation which preserves transition probabilities. So symmetry transformation is the realization of a symmetry on a quantum mechanical system. It must be some operation allowed by quantum mechanics and it preserves transition probabilities. That's sort of the bare minimum you'd expect from a symmetry operation. It means that if you had the system before the symmetry operation took place and you had two states, then the probability of measuring one in the other or a transition between these two states is exactly the same as if you had looked at the system after the symmetry transformation. Everything should be the same. That's what symmetry means, right? And so this then motivates why for every symmetry labeled by an element of a finite group, we want a corresponding operation U, right? We want a corresponding operation which does the symmetry labeled by G. And that brought us to the definition of a linear representation of a group. So we often use the, uh, the shortened terminology rep for representation. You'll hear me use that word a lot. Uh, on a vector space V, what is a linear representation of a group on a vector space V? complex vector space V, it's a homomorphism rho from G into the group of invertible tra linear transformations of that vector space V. This is not directly connected to quantum mechanics, this notion yet. Uh, and that means that if you've got ST inside the group, then that's the same as doing first T then S via this linear transformation row. So this is the standard mathematics definition of what is a representation of a group. It's a, for every element of the group, you have a corresponding operation that does the, the corresponding symmetry on, on the vector space V. Uh, and what's the bare minimum you require for it to have done the correct thing? Well, individually, any element is fine. Uh, any operation at all represents a single element of a group. What really matters is how these uh, operations play together. So you would want that whatever the operator is that corresponds to ST in the group, it better be the same as if I had done T then S separately. That's sort of the bare minimum you'd want, right? Oh, and you want that the doing nothing corresponds to the identity matrix. And then, then we had the notion of a unitary representation 
uh, of a group on a Hilbert space. So I'll write that above because for us, this is the thing that's far more important than quantum mechanics is we really care about unitary representations. Uh, and for that, we have a, a Hilbert space in mind. And there, nothing changes except uh, instead of GLV, we have U of H. U of H is a subgroup of GLV. Every invertible linear transformation, sorry, every unitary is an invertible linear transformation, but not vice versa. So typically, we're going to try and say things pretty general, right? We'll say many results. We will write them down for linear representations of groups on, on vector spaces. But really, really what we care about is un unitary representations of groups on Hilbert spaces. But since just about everything we say uh, will be true for both, I'll often or we'll often write down the results for linear representations of groups. But you get the same, like nothing changes if you just replace GLV with U of H almost all the time. In fact, things just get easier sometimes to prove things. Uh, but it's worth knowing more than one way to prove a thing, so mm, I'll be often phrasing things for these linear representations. Good. Then that was last time. So that's what it means uh, for a quantum mechanical system to exhibit or furnish a, or represent a symmetry or group of symmetries. There is some way of doing the symmetries on your quantum mechanical system. So now for the large part of the rest of this course, we're going to be talking about kind of the minimal quantum mechanical systems that allow you to do the symmetries. So the, this is kind of the goal of this course is to you know, understand you know in the first goal would be sorry the first goal is to understand somehow minimal quantum mechanical systems which have or which furnish or which represent a symmetry group G. So you can see what's, what's at play here. So, you know, throughout quantum mechanics in your previous lectures, you sort of start with a system and then ask what its symmetries are maybe. That's kind of the way a lot of quantum mechanics is presented, not all. But here we're going to invert this logic a little. We're going to start with groups that we like for some reason or another. And then we're going to try and find quantum mechanical systems which have those symmetries. And we're first interested in what are like the smallest quantum mechanical systems that would have, a sp have or furnish or represent a given set of symmetries. And just to give you a sense of where we would love to go with this, right, you know. Uh, oh, then, oh, yeah, yeah. Then we want to understand how to build other systems from these minimal systems, these like atoms of, of representations. Of, and then we want to completely classify them. So you can think of the steps of our lectures as like this. You know, first we want to understand, uh, does there exist quantum mechanical systems? that exhibit a certain group of symmetries? If so, uh, how do we build other systems from them or vice versa? Does a quantum mechanical system that exhibits a symmetry, is it built from these minimal systems? If so, uh, then why don't we try and classify all of them? Like what are all the possible quantum mechanical systems that have as their symmetries a certain group G? These are the questions, these are mathematical questions, but they're also physical questions. If you want to build something that does something, then you often want to know what are the building blocks. And sort of the long-term goal, which we won't achieve, uh, and which hasn't been achieved, I would, in a sense, hasn't yet been achieved, 
is, is kind of, this is, this is what quantization should have been, right? I'm going to now tell you, uh, I'm going to zoom out, I'm going to say this is what, you know, I, this is what we should have meant when we said the word quantization. So I have this argument that quantization doesn't make sense, this, this whole terminology, it's a nonsense, um, because it, it, it's effectively a category error, you're trying to invert a non-invertible function when you, you quantize a, a system. Uh, and uh, all these notions of canonical quantization and so on are not well posed as mathematical problems. That is so, that's just how it is. Uh, and uh, the, instead, when you want to design a quantum mechanical system that somehow is the quantum version of a classical system, you, uh, there's this ad hoc recipe you have to remember, you have to remember how to put hats on things and blah and blah and blah. And that's all true, but let's step back a bit and ask what, what, what was the question? You should, what we should have done is change the question. So quantization is answering the wrong question, I would argue. Quantization, canonic, in particular canonical quantization, what you've already been taught, what you know about quantization is just answering the wrong question. You shouldn't have even asked that question. We're going to unask the question and instead ask a different question. And that is, given, uh, and I'm going to say space and in brackets time. So what does the space time mean? It, it, it means you have some sense of position, of momentum. You, you have a, a, a notion of locality implicit in your, your understanding of this space or time or space time. So I'm trying to cover everything here in, in, one, in one word. Uh, we want to like, So this space-time is described by coordinates. No? The space-time is probably described by a manifold. Like this is something that you probably have heard already. You know that general relativity, in general relativity, space-time is a manifold. That's one of the fundamental assumptions of of general relativity, but there are other systems out there that we might be interested in. So let's ask the question, what quantum mechanical systems correspond to this space-time? This is the question now. So I'm being deliberately mega vague about what M is, right? M is maybe a manifold. M could be any, anything that you would interpret as space and time. It could be just the surface of the sphere. You could say, I want a quantum mechanical system corresponding to the surface of the sphere. It could be Minkowski space-time. I want a quantum mechanical system that corresponds to Minkowski space-time. That's, that's, it's the, it, we're not trying to quantize it, we're trying to find things that quant, uh, correspond to these things. So that's the question. What quantum mechanical systems correspond to M? Yo? What does that mean? I'm going to define what that means. <laughs> so you're wondering what does correspond to mean? If I'm not going to define anything, this is a kind of pointless discussion. So it, I'm totally going to define what that means, right? So because it's a manifold, let's, let's do something a little bit more. But once you can play this game, once you can play this game with, with this sort of setting, then you'll learn how to play this game in a much more general, in a much more general way. So let's suppose that we have some space time that's described by some manifold, um, and that this manifold has a metric on it. Okay, so that's, that's a lot of assumptions already there. And in fact, the metric part turns out to be maybe we can drop that. But let's just keep that metric there for now. So there's a notion of distance on this manifold. So in, in, in relativity, we know what distance means. It's the invariant interval. In, in Euclidean space, we know what distance means. It's really like the distance. And on the surface of a sphere, we know what distance means. It's like the, the, the great circle that connects two points, right? A, you've got to have a notion of distance. If you don't have a metric, then we're not going to play the game today. Um, and then we ask, you know, what, is, what would it mean to have a quantum mechanical system corresponding to M? Well, I need to define that word, right? You, you, you asked the right question. 
um, correspond. What does this mean? Well, what we really would like is that for every achievable operation on our manifold M, and I'll define what achievable means, there's a corresponding quantum mechanical operation implementing that operation. So what are the operations on a manifold? Well, it turns out there's a group of things that we should interpret as a legal operations on a manifold. It's called the isometry group. So for example, R3, that's Euclidean space. The isometries of R3 are so-called E3, the Euclidean group. Group of rotations plus translations plus reflections. Okay. So the manifold e th uh, R3, like Euclidean space, the, the operations which preserve distances, right, the symmetries, the symmetries of R3 are completely classified by the Euclidean group of rotations, translations, and reflections. Those are the symmetries. They don't change distances between things on that space-time. In a sense, the space-time itself is identifiable with the isometry group. The isometry group can generate the space-time. If I give it just one point in the space-time and I start applying elements of the symmetry group, then I get the whole space-time. In this case, space, right? So there's one example, R3. What about another example? Well, we could take Minkowski space time, R3, comma, 1, depending on your metric convention, R1, comma, 3, or whatever. And then, of course, we have as our group of isometries of Minkowski space-time is the Poincaré group. Lorentz transformations, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have to stop there. The surface of, well, a sphere. There, the isometry group is O3, the rotation group. Uh, okay, I've just written down three examples, but now I hope you start to see how this works. Just dream up a space now. You just think of something that's kind of, kind of crazy, like, I don't know, a triangle. Just imagine you live in a universe which is a triangle. It's like this. You're allowed to live anywhere inside a triangle. This also has an isometry group. It's a finite group. It's just a group of rotations and reflections. You know, if you live in the universe of a little square, it's the dihedral group from yesterday. So every one of these spaces has, there's always an isometry group, as long as it's somehow a metric space. Each one of these spaces has a corresponding isometry group. And now, what does it mean, correspond? I, I hope you can see where this is going. You will have quantized, or you've at least found a quantum system that has the symmetries, the same symmetries as the space that you are interested in, if you could find So this is, I don't know. You quantize your system effectively when you can find a Hilbert space H and a unitary rep of isom M on H. You will have done the job, right? So that means a map from 
every possible isometry into some unitary operator acting on your Hilbert space H. And the word representation you know, carries with it this baggage that if you do, it, that it's a homomorphism. So I would argue that's really what we mean by quantization. We don't mean that coordinates get hats on them. We never meant that. We just meant that everything that was a symmetry operation on our corresponding classical space should have a corresponding symmetry counterpart on the quantum mechanical space. That's really what we mean. Because after all, transitions are what matter, not, not absolute points in our space. We should never have quantized the coordinates That's, uh, uh, of Euclidean space. We should never have done that. Why, would, why did we attempt that? That, that, was, that was silly, right? We knew that that was a human thing to put coordinates on a manifold. We want a coordinate free way of associating quantum mechanical systems with spaces. And this is completely coordinate free. I don't have to say a coordinate at any point, actually. So an isometry group doesn't care about what coordinates we used. The Hilbert space doesn't care about what coordinates we use. The mapping of a unitary, uh, uh, the association of a unitary to every operation here clearly doesn't depend on any coordinate system anyway. So this is the right way to quantize quantum mechanical systems. Uh, it's a hard way to quantize quantum mechanical systems. It's not like I don't have a recipe to do this yet, but we'll see how to build a recipe uh, that works for finite groups. A bit disappointing, but hey. Um, and it also works for, for like the rotation group and a couple of others. Uh, so I don't have a magic recipe. It's just as hard as quantization is in effect. But morally speaking, that's what we should have been thinking right, when we wanted to quantize something. And what I also want to point out, and this is, a, uh, I'll keep coming back to this, it's a simple comment, but it's one that you, you should start to get used to. The symmetry group of Minkowski space-time contains in it translations. Translations in space, you can go that way, you can go that way, you can go that way, but it also has a translation in time. So corresponding to translations in time, what are they? Well, that's a, that's a symmetry, right? So to every translation in time, there is a unitary that does the translation in time on the quantum mechanical system. And what that's known as the Schrodinger equation, is the generator of this. That's the, the thing that does this translation in time. But there's also a translation in x and y. And here, here comes the interesting thing. What we call time here, what we call time here gets mixed by Lorentz transformations, right? That's the thing about relativity. If you do a, if you have, affine space where time is a separate coordinate, when you do the symmetries, the isometries of that space, you don't mix time and space in, 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 in classical mechanics. But you certainly do with special relativity. And it's a real headache when you, you think in terms of time as a kind of separate dimension and you want to find a quantum mechanical system that exhibits time translation. It's a real pain. And because the Lorentz transformations, they kind of mess everything up and you get really confused. And most people I know have gotten confused at some point around that, 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 that area. But if you think like this, if you think, okay, what really matters is that to every Poincaré group transformation there's a unitary, then automatically everything plays nicely together. The Lorentz transformations rotate things in the right way, the translations rotate things in the right way, and the time translations also rotate things in the right way. They all play all nice together, and you can see uh, how uh, things get mixed, so a Lorentz transformation, we maybe touch on this at the end of the course, but this is really quantum field theory now. How, for example, you do a, a translation in time followed by a Lorentz transformation. Yeah. T stands for translate in time, S for Lorentz transformation. Imagine doing that, right? Well, does that commute? No, it does not, right? You know, translating in time, then Lorentz boosting is not the same as boosting and then translating. It, it intertwines, that's the more important word there. And all of that you get automatically for free from this definition. So with this incredibly simple definition, right, it took what, two lines on the blackboard, you can capture very complex phenomena ex exhibited by manifolds like the Minkowski, like Minkowski space. Um, yep. I, I have a question, but I, I still haven't understood how we check that the, um, this, this representation does what we want it to do. Uh, so the question is, how do we check that it does what we want to do? Well, uh, there's two ways to check, right? 
One is you, firm it, you write it down and then you check. That's method one. Okay, it's tedious. Maybe it doesn't even work. The second method, and that's the way we're going to advocate in this course, is you find firstly the minimum quantum mechanical systems that exhibit that, that symmetry group G, so they give you representations. And then you go, okay, these aren't really the one I have in mind. But now I want to build up bigger systems that still have that symmetry, so they automatically obey this symmetry or give you representations. And that's the strategy or, or, or way of working we'll have in this course. We build the atoms, we'll build up bigger systems from smaller systems. It doesn't quite work, unfortunately, for Minkowski space. Right, that's why we need quantum field theory. There's a lot more, it, it, it's, it's non-trivial, right? It's su sufficiently non-trivial that we can't do that program easily for Minkowski space. It's kind of doable, but it's... So that's, that's kind of like a vision, right? The vision of where we want to go. But I wanted to give you this insight into the vision of where we want to go right now, because I think you can understand the words or get a sense of these words. And as we go through the course and start doing this for little groups, you'll start, I hope, to be able to extrapolate, like, you know, we'll do it for like tiny groups, like groups of reflections and things like that. And you'll be like, okay, I understand that. And now you can extrapolate, you know, where's this going to go? Well, it goes in the direction of these more complicated groups here. But let's walk before we can run now. And we're going to start understanding how to check if a system exhibits a symmetry. In other words, gives us a unitary representation. And we're going to do so by reducing our our task to minimal quantum mechanical systems which exhibit a symmetry. Once we've understood those, we can build other ones or decompose bigger ones into those. That's, that's where we're going. Okay. So a notation, now a note about matrices. All right, so we're, we're gonna, this is all the stuff here the dimension of your Hilbert space is usually infinity to, 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 to do this stuff on this board here. That's too hard. I mean, it's not in this case, actually. But in that case above, it is. Okay. So it, it's actually a really hard problem, what I've written on the board here, like super hard. Instead, we're going to focus on smaller setting, which is still sort of combinatorially deeply non-trivial. We're going to focus on situations where we have a group of symmetries G for the moment, where the number of elements in the group is less than infinity. So we have finite groups. And we're going to focus on cases where our vector space um, is finite dimensional. That's why I can say the word matrices. So it's, for the most part, in fact, for the, uh, basically for the rest of the lectures, I'm just going to assume everything's finite dimensional. So immediately, everything we say cannot apply to these more difficult examples. It's just it's the way it is. And, you know, but hopefully, you'll see the concepts and be able to think, OK, this is where it will go. Now, as soon as we have a finite dimensional vector space, we can furnish a basis. As soon as we have a vector space, it's tempting to introduce some basis or another. And uh, we let and then we can take these, these matrices here, these row, wherever I wrote them, row S of T's matrices here, we can take them, uh, uh, operators, sorry, these are operators, row S and T. And we can take them and just write them in terms of their corresponding matrix representation. Yeah? Okay, I've just assumed that we have a Hilbert space in that line there. Because I've implied an inner product. If you don't have a Hilbert space, you can still write matrix elements out. Right? So, you can talk about row S this homomorphism, or you can talk about the uh, a matrix interchangeable, right? As soon as you have a matrix, you can define row, 
as soon as you have rho, you can associate a matrix to each element of S, uh, of each element of the group G. And these matrices, if rho is a representation, So this makes this the problem of finding representations of verifying that we have operations that, uh, that do the right things. It reduces our search space to finding matrices which do the right things. So somehow basis, you, you know, we should do everything coordinate free without a basis in mind, but somehow when we check things, you always need a basis, right? So this is, uh, that's really what we're gonna be looking for when we try and find representations of a group. There is a general way to construct these matrices. Given a group, you can actually, there's like a recipe. Here is the matrix elements, and then you can write them all out. And I'll show you that recipe in the coming lectures. So there's this, like this, the group tells you all its minimal uh, representations. It's kind of magical. The group will tell you them. But that takes a little bit of time before we get there. Uh, and okay, I won't write it out, but I hope it's clear that if you do have a bunch of matrices like that, doing the right thing, then you can create a map row, a homomorphism row, which is basis free. Probably I should do some examples. Just so you, you know, this is totally abstract, right? So, so why don't I do some examples? I'm going to write out two examples. So let's take this group, this is kind of like the smallest non-trivial group with the multiplication or addition table, however you like to say it, product table 0, 0, 1, 1. Let's take this group and I'm going to give you some representations in form of matrices now. And you can hopefully verify that they're, they're representations. So let's take V is C2, build a two-dimensional representation of this group. And how does it work? Well, corresponding to the element zero, we're gonna have the matrix, well, there's only one choice, right? Zero is the identity element of the group, it has to be the identity. I cannot do it any other way. And the element one shouldn't be the same as the identity, otherwise it's trivial. So what could we do? Well, you could choose you know, not any matrix will do actually, right? Let's, what if I just wrote like this, three, seven, one, eight, right? Would that work as a representation? 
Why does it not work? It's not unitary, okay, that's, that's true. It is invertible though, so why isn't this a representation, this matrix of the group? It doesn't close under products, yeah. So if I, if I take this matrix and I multiply it by itself, what should I get, right? Well, let, this is R1. So according to the group rule here, if I take R1 and multiply it by R1, I better get the representation matrix for, for zero, R0, zero, which is the identity. So does this matrix square to the identity? I mean, it doesn't, right? So that's, that's how you can see that just demanding the homomorphism property already tells you sort of a striking amount of information. So that's, let's erase this bad matrix. And now you know what the search space is, right? It's the set of matrices that square to one. It's a big space. So you can choose any one you like. Let's choose this one. But we could have chosen this one. Right? That squares to the identity just as well as this one. So why did, you, you know, is, is this problem even well posed now? Is it well posed to look for matrices that obey these rules? It looks like there's an infinite number of solutions already. And there are an infinite number of solutions. But we'll deal with that in a second. I'll give another example. to also emphasize that matrices can be one-dimensional. So we can have one-dimensional representations. So here in this, uh, I'm not gonna write out the group table for Z over three Z, but it's the group of numbers addition modulo three. Uh, the representation we'll choose is just the number one, which is a one by one matrix, right? Uh, for one, we choose E to the two pi I over three the matrix that the one by one matrix which has e to the two pi over three in it and for two we choose e to the two pi i over three times two the, the one by one matrix that is e to the two pi i over three times two that's three matrices r naught r one So now you also see something interesting here. Uh, you can verify that's a representation. You can, you can start to see, if you look up here, you might think, ah, well, mm, okay. Then I, I probably could find a one-dimensional representation of this group up here as well, couldn't I? I could have. The answer is absolutely yes. There is a one-dimensional representation of Z over 2Z. So what's going on here, right? We, it's clear we can have representations of different dimensions. It's clear some are somehow different, but somehow the same. And, uh, and that there are somehow smallest representations. You can't get smaller than one dimensional. So what's going on? There's a whole lot of questions that are opened up by these examples. And the one that we're gonna take aim at all these questions in the next two lectures. And the, the first thing we're gonna do is like, how is this guy? different from that guy? Or are they just the same in disguise? Turns out they're the same, right? They're, the, they're obviously the same, right? You, you can feel it. When you, when you work with this, you just know that it's the same as that one. But let's, let's explain how they're the same. So that's the next thing we need to talk about. We need to talk about equivalence of representations. When do we say two representations are actually the same? When are they actually different? And I'll define what the word actually means. The trick to understanding that these two are actually the same representation is that they differ by something. What's the difference between them? We don't ask what's the same, let's ask what's the difference. And the difference is a rotation. It's just that we're looking at this, at this matrix in a different basis. There is a matrix which rotates this one into that one. And I can't write it down right now because that would be, I forgot what it is. But it, there is one, there is a matrix. I can do it with another one. I'll do it in a second. All 
I will write it down. There's another one that we could have written down, uh, which is over here. Okay, you can also check that r prime prime, which is one minus one, also squares to the identity. So it's also a good representation. And now if you look at these two, then the, it, it's easy for me now to write down the basis transformation that makes them the same. Yep. Two pi i divided by three multiplied by two. So two, oh, not squared, oh, two. So now I, I, I at least have remembered the matrix which rotates this one into this one. And it's the Hadamard matrix. So, so the Hadamard matrix is a unitary matrix which rotates, uh, I think, that one into that one and vice versa. Yes. So you're asking, why do we want to rotate this one into this one? Because this pair of matrices here is a representation of this group. This pair is a representation of the same group. But somehow they're the same, right? These two, they look different. Different things are inside them. But they, they behave the same somehow. They have the same dimension. They. Ah, uh, why don't we want to rotate this matrix? Because uh, every way we have a rotating, it will always end up with the identity. I'll tell you what, uh, in one second you'll see what I mean by rotate. Uh, yeah, yeah, one. So rotate means conjugate matrix by. Change basis. Yeah? I'm changing the... This matrix here is the same as R prime prime in a different basis. And that basis is given by H. That basis change is given by H. And so why don't we rotate the first matrix? Well, we actually do. We totally do rotate that matrix. So it just turns out that H inverse composed the identity, because it's a representation, R naught prime prime has to be the identity per definition, that that gives us the identity. So the identity is the identity in every basis. OK, so now I've just implicitly told you a notion of sameness for representations. And let's just turn that into an actual definition. Oops, sorry. So this statement is the equivalent to saying 
that if two representations that we call them similar, not, not the same anymore, we're going to use a proper definition, we're going to use the right words, these two representations are similar or isomorphic. If there exists a linear isomorphism, what's a linear isomorphism? It's a basis change such that doing the action of one symmetry, then the basis change is the same as first changing your basis and then the other. And by multiplying by the inverse of tau on the other side here, you get to this notion up here. And it turns out these three representations that I wrote down here, they're all isomorphic. There exists a basis change which rotates these three into each other. So in terms of matrices, this definition Remember, you can always talk about either the matrix representations of a, of a homomorphism or the homomorphism. Here I wrote the definition in terms of linear maps without a basis. Here we're just saying if we choose a basis, the fact that this representation is the same, similar to this one, means there exists an invertible matrix, tau, T, which does that. So that's matrix similarity, right? That's, that's, what, that's how we say that two representations are equivalent. Good. One of the nice things about representation theory is you get a couple of representations for free, for every group, always for free. No matter how weird and complicated your group is, here are some examples you always get. And you should rep remember these three examples because whenever you have a group, you, write, you can immediately write down these three examples for that group. And that, that furnishes your first basic examples of quantum mechanical systems which exhibit a group symmetry. Yep, question? Very, very good question. I love it. Uh, can you have an infinite dimensional representation of a finite group? Absolutely, yes. Um, but it turns out that you can always think of that representation as being made up of an infinite number of copies of finite dimensional representations. We're going to prove that. So, yeah, you can, but now where it gets super interesting is when you have infinite dimensional groups and infinite dimensional representations, there things get really crazy. But yeah, you can totally have infinite dimensional representations of finite groups. Okay, but all the ones I'm going to do now are finite dimensional. Okay, this one you always have for free, the trivial representation. This means that the space of representations is not empty. So this is already important information. So this is the map that takes uh, G, uh, the group to the set of matrices or, or invertible linear maps of vector spaces of dimension one, right? So one by one matrices. And how does it work? Well, it's super simple. You attach the number one to every element of the group. Certainly obeys the homomorphism property, right? Rho st is the same as rho s times rho t and the identity property. 
So there we go, we have a representation. The, these things exist. It's trivial, but non-empty. And now comes, I would say, the intuitively most obvious representation that you can always have. Once you've seen it, I hope it becomes intuitive, but maybe you won't think of it straight away. So the regular representation, what is it? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to build a vector space out of the group itself. So for every element in the group, we're going to have a dimension in this vector space. So for then every element in the group, every, everything labeled by an element of the group, we find or we attach a basis element ES. So you'll see in a second that this is the, 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 the regular representation of the group Z2 in a second. So for every basis vector, we, uh, every element of the group, there is a corresponding basis vector that's considered to be linearly independent uh, to the other one. And then we define rho of s to send the basis vector et to the basis vector uh, I always get the order wrong with these things um, let me have a look yeah that's correct So we'll I'll argue in a second that, that that does exactly this. And in particular, rho s on the basis vector corresponding to the identity becomes e of s. So actually, this representation is completely determined by how rho of s acts on this one vector, because it goes through all the group here. So let's just quickly verify that this is indeed the regular representation here. So firstly, is the dimension of this representation equal to the order of the group? Well, the answer is yes, right? There's two elements in this group. There's two dimensions in this representation here. Which basis vector do we have corresponding to row uh, zero, uh, element zero? Well, the basis vector one, zero, that's a basis vector. We just attach it to zero. And the basis vector that we attach to one is 0, 1. It's also a basis vector of a two-dimensional vector space. How does rho act on E0? Well, it takes E0 to E0, right? Mm -hmm. Rho 1 on... Ah, sorry, I had a... No, no, it's fine. I, 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 yeah, you, you see that I got confused, but this is... I think it's correct what I wrote. So rho, when it acts on the, the basis vector of the, the identity element, gives you itself again. But then when you act with one, you've got to get you know, E naught plus compose one gives you E one, and you get that matrix there. So this is the regular representation of the group G is Z over two Z. Very, very handy to know the regular representation. You always have it for free. Yeah? In this case now, the E zero vector would be the E identity. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. in this case, E zero is the E identity vector here. That you, saw, you saw how I got confused. Um, so maybe I should have used a different letter here. So I'll just say F, F. That way, F, F of zero means E1 here. I'm sorry about that. It's, I didn't invent the notation for this group. So it's, when you think additively, you use zero for the identity. When you think multiplicatively, you use one for the identity. So it's going to be a constant problem in this course. But.
So it's a, it's a great representation, the regular one. It's big, like it's not tiny, and it does what the group does. It's non-trivial, generally speaking. Let's do the final representation that we get for free. Every finite group has this representation, but not... Oh, when you get to infinite groups, it's a bit more complicated, this, this last one. So the last one is the permutation representation. Uh, so G acts on itself. That's something very nice about groups. You can have, the, you can think of the group as a set, and then you can multiply on the left, and then you get new. You, you know, it moves all the elements of the group around. Okay, suppose G acts on a set. So somehow you know that your group is doing things to a set and the set in question will turn out to be G itself. And what that means is that there's a permutation for every uh, permutation of the set X uh, labeled by elements of G. So you get a permutation for every element of the set G. And it better be a, a, a representation, so that means that if you do nothing, if you do the identity symmetry, then the permutation that you, you do is the identity permutation. And if you do one permutation and another corresponding to T and S in the group, then it better be the same as the permutation of S and T. Um, this automatically gives us a representation. That means it gives us a bunch of matrices.
it's very similar to the regu regular representation, except that G can act on itself in different ways. In the regular representation, G is acting on itself by the, from the left. And you sometimes call this the left regular representation. However, you uh, can act on G from the right. You can multiply on the right, and that induces a different permutation, pi S of X. Or you can act on G from both sides with G, G inverse. There's many ways to get a group to act on itself, and they all give uh, these permutation representations. So now you've seen, for a couple of relatively simple groups, some example representations. Here you've seen that there exists always representations, some big ones, right? The bigger the group, the bigger these representations can get. They can get quite large. And you've uh, seen that some of them are equivalent, some are not. So now we can start to play this game. We can start to ask the question, when is one the same as another? Are there ones that aren't the same as any others? You know, they're all the same, but apart from that one. Uh, we can ask these questions and we can answer these questions as well uh, relatively quickly. So it takes not so much effort, which is very nice, uh, to do that. And then we can, uh, uh, for example, answer the question, is the permutation representation the same as the trivial one? Wherever I wrote the trivial one down. And uh, yeah, so it could be, right, that the trivial one is really the same as the regular one. There could exist an invertible linear transformation, right? Is this one even non-trivial at all, this regular one? Maybe not. Maybe it is just kind of the trivial one in disguise. How can we answer this question? So it turns out we will be able to answer this question by using invariance, or so-called character theory. That's how we will get to know that one is different from another. But before we talk about character theory and invariance, we want to first understand when does one representation contain another. So they may not be the same, two representations may not be the same, but it might turn out that one kind of lives inside the other. So let's try and understand those words living inside another what can we say how what does it even mean right you know so uh and I, I just erased it but it turns out that the representations i wrote here these two by two matrices they literally contain two copies of one dimensional representations they're actually not really two dimensional they're really one dimensional representations in disguise so that's not obvious This brings us to the topic of sub-representation. When does one representation contain inside it copies of other ones? Well, you know, I can almost, the words almost tell you what to write. So we let other way around. When would one representation contain another? Well, the, the intuitively, I hope, clear way to do it is if you have some sub, you know, you have some representation on some vector space V, and then you have some subspace, and somehow the group acts independently on the subspace. That would be a sub-representation. That's exactly the definition.
Okay, I hope this, this feels clear. Uh, if you've got some subspace, some bigger space, and you've got a bunch of matrices, row S or operators acting on this vector space, then suppose you have a vector inside the subspace, the smaller vector space here, and you act on it with all the possible symmetries that you can, and you get all the possible results, and you find that every time you do so, it still lands in the smaller subspace, then we would say that W is a stable or invariant subspace, and therefore sub-representation of these symmetries like that. Uh, what do I have to say? Oh yeah, here I'm going to use this notation a lot, so get used to it. Um, I will often write instead of row s, just row subscript s. It's the same thing. Question? Yep. That there is uh, uh, row s, row subscript s is also like this. Yep. Yep, sorry, I did that here as well without telling you. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, row S is the same as row S. <laughs> it's a notation thing. Okay, so that's... Yo, another question? I, I, so the question, you're confused by the, the permutation representation here, and you're wondering if I'm talking about a group of permutations here. Yeah, I am, yeah, I totally am. Okay. Yeah, so what we're doing is we ha we're identifying G with a group of, of permutations and first. Which well, th that's the hard bit, right? Okay. Uh, you, it's not obvious how to do that, but there is something, yeah, I never wrote this down, so that's why it's non-trivial. Uh, so, which ones? I, I guess you're paraphrasing your question. It's like, which permutations do I use here? Yeah, like, so, so you're saying something that you can, you can induce a permutation representation when there is a permutation group that has these things. That's right, yeah. Is, this ob is it possible to always find these permutations like that? The answer is yes, and I'll, sh I'll quickly show you how to build it here. I, I said it in, in words a bit quick, so... Um, Let's consider the permutation group. So let G be the, this is the number of elements of, in the group G. And we'll give it an, a name, let's call it whatever, uh, N. Consider the permutation group SN. So this is the permutation group on N symbols. So it takes, it acts on the set one, two, all the way up to N. Now, instead of numbering them 1 to n, I'm going to label them differently. I'm just going to label them with elements of the group. So the first well, 1 is 1, but 2 is just g, the first element of the group. We'll call it g1 or something. And then g2 all the way up to g n minus 1. So consider the permutation group just on all the items of the group itself. So that's, that's all possible permutations of things in the group elements in the group. Now that's a very big group, that's way bigger than G itself. Like the order of this group is G factorial, so there's super lots of permutations here. Now let's focus only on those permutations that come from the group itself. So what does that even, what do these words mean? So a permutation comes from the group, we're going to define one. You know, so pi, there's a permutation that acts on the group itself. How does it work? Well what we do is we take, uh, we define it as follows pi s and then some element of the group is literally that element multiplied from the left. And you're like, is this a permutation? And the answer is it is a permutation because it's uh, invertible. Why is it invertible? Because there's always an inverse s that will undo this permutation here. So that's these are the permutations I'm talking about up here. They're the, the permutations induced by the group acting on itself from the left. And maybe you need an example to believe me. <laughs> Questions? 
Yep. So, uh, what do you mean about the SN? The, uh, the, the, uh, do you mean the SN to be the set of uh, the set S? Or what do I mean the set to be the set S? No. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll do an example, and this should clarify yeah, things. Do a quick example, and that hopefully should clear up quite a lot of these questions. So, let's consider for our group. I'll just do this little group again, but hopefully you'll start to understand how it works. So, that's just a group consisting of two things, right? Zero and one, and we know how they add, uh, they compose or what the group op operation is. And now let's consider. And so what's the order of G? The order of G is 2. Uh, and we're now going to consider the permutation group S order G. So it's a set of all permutations of two things. And we're going to allow these permutations to act on the group itself. So to every permutation of two things, there corresponds a permutation of these elements of the group there. So S of order G is just a set of all permutations of the set of all elements to itself. Now, there's a couple of very special permutations that we can build. So we can build pi naught. That one's kind of the obvious one, right? So Pi naught is a permutation. Right. Here again, we have the zero one problem, um, but you, I hope you see. So pi naught is the, the permutation which takes every element of the group and just gives it back. So it's, a perm it's in here, right? It's, it's a permutation of the group itself. And then pi one, how does that work? Well, that's the same as doing the group operation, um, which in our case is addition modulo one, uh, modulo two. So what is this permutation? It's a perm I claim it's a permutation. Like that's not completely obvious that multiplying from the left is, or, or using the group operation from the left is a permutation. It, it, it is. Let's find out how it acts, right? So pi one on the element zero is one and pi one on the element one is zero. So indeed, it's a permutation. It's a permutation that flips 0 and 1. And you just do exactly this game, but with any other group. And you, the only thing that you, I hope uh, that might be somehow doubtful is that when you go through the elements of the group like this, you build these permutations that you're like, is this a permutation? Like why, why is it a permutation? And the answer is, well, because you can invert it. Right? It's a one-to-one -one map that's invertible. That requires that you use the group rule of their existent inverse. Okay, so let's jump back to sub-representations. So this, in, this, this thing here, noticing this stable subspace, this induces a sub-representation. So just by restricting our attention to those vectors inside of W, we get a sub-representation row S of W. And then there's a very important result that we can now state. And I mean, I won't prove it today, but I can probably run through the proof in the next lecture.
So this theorem is quite a powerful theorem. In fact, it using it, we're going to gain a lot of insight into how representations are built from other ones. So I'll give you a kind of pictorial version of this theorem. So for that I need three colors. So we're going to think about how G acts on a vector space and on subspaces. So here we got a subspace W in this theorem, right? We got, a, we got some big vector space V. G is rotating it and you know, doing the symmetries on it. But it turns out that there's a subspace of V, which also remains closed under all these symmetries. It's like it never le the symmetries never take anything out of W. And then this, this theorem just says, OK, fine. But it turns out. Uh, uh, that's great, but if everything stays inside of W, then everything outside of W, in a certain sense, has to stay outside of W. And that's what this theorem says. And what is the stuff outside of W? It's a complement. A complementary vector space exists that uh, is also left invariant or stable under G. And that's very powerful, because if you have a big, really big representation and you find yourself a sub one, then you know there's always another one, the rest. So I'll draw a picture of it. So here's, imagine that V, the big vector space, is a three-dimensional vector space. And let's imagine that we have a two-dimensional subspace W, right, which is stable. So when G acts by whatever rotations or slidings or whatever, yeah, it, um, when G acts on it, uh, it keeps W in itself. So, for example, what would keep W in itself is like rotations around this z-axis would, would keep W in itself. Translations would keep W in itself. So you can just sort of imagine symmetries operations which are keeping W in itself. That's these, these orange lines are G, right? The actions of G. This is rho of S. And then what the theorem says is, yeah, sure, you've identified W. That's invariant. Um, OK, the translations uh, were a bad choice. Um, <laughs> just rotations, <laughs> just rotations, right? Um, or scalings, you could imagine, scaling everything out by a factor. Then there exists a complementary subspace. Then what's a complementary subspace of W? It's another subspace which has intersection only on the zero element and which together with W build all of V. And so for us, there's only one complementary vector space, and it's the pink line here. It's a one-dimensional vector space. That's W naught. So we have that V equals uh, W plus W naught in this case. That's what complementary subspace means, that W is expressible as a direct sum of W and the complement W naught. And W naught, it's clear from the picture that, there, that W naught sort of points that way, but we have that W naught is also invariant under the action of, v, of G. So that's what the theorem says. You always get this other one. You can always find this other one. And the proof is sort of not mega complicated. It takes a couple of lines. Uh, how am I going to do this? I guess I'll just start the proof today and finish it next week. We've got a couple of minutes. I might actually finish it. I'm not sure.
So what's important to note is there's, an, there's a, a bijection between projections and complements. That's something I did, I've got to say at this point. So there is a... So corresponding to every subspace of W, there's always a projection P. And corresponding to the complement, there's a kernel of P. That's the things that are annihilated by the projection. So every bipartition of a vector space into a, a sub-vector space and its complement, is, that's in bijection with projections P and kernels of P. So that's something you need to know for this proof. So the, the, the way the proof works, the idea is to build a projection P that's invariant under G, and that will automatically give us something that's a kernel which is invariant under G. Okay, I told you the proof. So let's, let's then write out the equation that does that. Find it, we're going to build a projection P which is invariant under G, whatever this means. And I'm going to show you now, which is one of the most powerful tricks that you'll see. It is used over and over again, always, everywhere, people are using this trick. It's the, the trick of representation theory. What we're going to do is we're going to average over the group. This is this this is this the universal trick that always works. We're going to construct a projector P naught, which is invariant under G. And how are we going to do it? Well, we're going to take our pro the projection that we get from W. So it's not clear that that W the projection onto W is invariant under G. We're going to take the projection that comes from So we take any old projection that we like that projects onto this subspace W, and the projection itself might not be invariant under G, whatever that means. But here's a way to make it invariant under G, always makes it invariant under G. This is the trick, the trick of group representation theory. It gets used all the time. When you have something that's not symmetric, how do you make it symmetric? Well, you just do the thing on it and average over doings, all the doings, and then you'll have something that per definition is symmetric. So we're going to give this a name. This is called the averaging trick. I'm going to leave it as an, I'm going to tell you the steps and leave them as an exercise for the weekend, but we'll go and prove them next, next week on Monday. So here's the idea of the proof without actually doing the proof. So the first thing is to argue that P0 is a projection onto W, like that we, we still get a projection and that it, it takes W and things in outside of W onto W. That's pretty easy to argue. Just stick in something from W and chase it through. Then the next thing you've got to worry about is that, uh, ah, yeah, it's invariant under G. You've got to argue that doing something from G commutes with P naught. So if you do a symmetry transformation first, 
and then project onto W, you better get the same thing as if you'd done the projection onto W and done the symmetry transformation. And then you're kind of done because kernel of P naught is our complementary subspace. It's also invariant under the action of the group. So that's the three steps of the proof. It, it's to, to, to expand each line here is only two or three equations, but it will take a little bit longer than the time we have for today. So um, I'll call this a proof, <laughs> a proof by exercise, um, but it, it'll, I'll give you the solution in the next lecture to this exercise. Um, it's important to note that this is one of the building blocks of, of representation theory, this averaging trick gets used all the time to create symmetric things from unsymmetric things. You know, you have a, a, a slightly messy object and you want it to be spherical, what do you do? Well, you start, you know, spinning it around and chopping bits off, averaging. So you spin it around, you smooth it out, and then you get a sphere. So that's the, the mental picture you should have from the averaging trick. And so it's very powerful for constructing invariant things. And invariant things are what representations are and symmetries are. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much. Until next time.